Professor David Lee, welcome to In Conversation. You're most welcome, my pleasure. Professor, is the energy crisis in China coming at a really bad time? Well, you may say that. I also agree uh, because the economy is now recovering. Finally, factories are busy, but at the worst moment, the power is off. Right. So you're right. But why is this happening? Is this bad luck? I mean, we all know that energy prices all over the world, coal, gas are all rising. But is there also an element of bad planning? It's not a bad luck. It's a problem of uh, an unintended consequence of a reform China has been doing. The unintended consequence. What is the reform? The reform was to trying to put the coal industry in order by trying to cut off the small and unsafe coal mines. And those unsafe coal mines used to produce on the site. So that used to be that the figure of Chinese coal production uh, was actually much larger than the official statistic. So, so a lot of hidden production of coal uh, was gone before the crisis. Therefore, the short supply of coal really cranked up the price of coal, which made the power plants uh, unprofitable. And they, therefore, they cut power generation and therefore the prices. What about those who say that this has been exacerbated by China's green goals? Uh, that story is very appealing, very theoretically very attractive. However, it's not the case. It is not the case at all. The, 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 the main reason, the only reason is the shortage of supply of coal and uh, that's the only reason. That reason explains the rapid increase of price of coal, which oh, in turn gave a very low negative profit of the power generators, and which gave trouble to local governments who are trying to crank up their GDP. So that in the end, local governments resort to cutting off power supply to households, to households, let households complain. And that began to solve the problem. It's not a story of uh, uh, greening up the industry. The greening up the industry, uh, low, uh, the controlling carbon dioxide is a long-term plan. It's not this time, this time around, unfortunately, it's not the case. So you don't think that these long-term green goals could also have a long-term bad impact on China's GDP? Uh, yes, you're right. That is the story of greening up of the Chinese economy uh, causing crisis. That's our next crisis. That's not this crisis, okay? You're right. You're right theoretically, but that crisis is yet to come. I agree with you that down the road, the Chinese economy will suffer some shocks from the rush to low carbon power generation. Okay, yes, so, but not this time around. This time around is super, super, super simple. That is the shortage of supply of the coal which is caused by uh, shutting down small and unsafe coal mines. We're going into winter, so this is only going to get worse, Prof. And many of the factories are already complaining that they're only getting power for three days a week. Let me give you two anecdotes, okay? One anecdote is that during the summer, I literally went down to one of the very good coal mines, 200 meters up below ground, okay? I was surprised to see that workers were very, very relaxed. They, they stopped the production only for me for 30 minutes. I told them, don't stop, don't stop, because every minute counts million, millions of Chinese yuan. You're wasting millions of Chinese yuan. They said, no, 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 we are fine. We are, we are reaching this year's target. We don't want to be too pro profitable. The, 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 the leader accompanied me to the factory. This shows that the coal mines are having slack in production capacity. Now the slack is now tightened. They're producing uh, more uh, uh, coal. So another anecdote I tell you, I have um, good friends in the Chinese uh, uh, NDRC, you know, NDRC National Development and Reform Commission. They are the super ministry of the Chinese economy. And they have one department in charge of making sure power supply, coal supply, natural gas supply, and transportation are in order, okay? They are the commander, center of command of the whole Chinese economy in terms of logistics. And they are super, super busy. And now they're working 
very hard and very effectively resolving the coal supply problem. So I have, uh, so the coal issue, I'm not concerned. I, we can talk about other issues, but the coal issue, I think we, we are seeing the end of the story. Why didn't the central bank see this coming? They knew how much the commercial banks were lending to Evergrande. Well, uh, first of all, the Evergrande case is, uh, in my view, 10 times as damaging as the power shortage, okay? The Evergrande is a real case, it's a real problem, okay? And uh, my second point is that most people in the government and also economists like me uh, were anticipating the Evergrande or other property developers to run into trouble. So people were, were concerned. Arguably, the central bank was over-concerned. The central bank tightened their policy regarding lending to Evergrande and other, and other developers, I argue, prematurely. And that pushed Evergrande into default. And uh, in China, we have a well, policy in the policy community, we have, a, we have a phrase saying three red lines. The three red lines are three parameters that uh, the central bank gives to uh, commercial banks in deciding whether to give uh, lend, uh, funds or, or loans to uh, developers or not. These three parameters are about the, uh, the financial uh, status of the developers. Now, I argue that that was pretty mature. That not three, that three red lines was uh, implemented about one year ago, okay? Now, the next issue is what, why, why, why Evergrande went into trouble? Well, the answer is super, super simple. Evergrande was too eager and too hasty and too careless in trying to move away from the property market. Evergrande company and its head, uh, his, uh, it's a chairman, uh, I know whom I know very well, okay? Uh, they knew, they knew that the property market is not the future of the company. However, the company and the, the, the chairman uh, were too eager. They, they, moved, they moved in a big, big rush into other industries. And with industries, unfortunately, are not in their expertise. So I knew the problem is coming. I personally told uh, the chairman of Evergrande uh, no, in a polite way, okay, in a very polite way. I said, okay, be careful uh, about your new businesses, okay? This, some of the businesses you entered are already very, very crowded, okay? Anyway, so my final point is that uh, what will happen? Okay, what will happen, okay? I believe the central bank has already effectively eased its policy uh, about uh, uh, property developers in order to prevent a potential propagation of the Evergrande case into other companies. Now is the and, bubble really bursting? Yeah, the, well, the bubble, I do not think the bubble will be bursting uh, overnight, okay? Uh, actually, there are, there are two kinds of, uh, at least two kinds of property markets in China. The first kind is uh, the markets uh, of in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, where uh, the, the supply of land for residential housing is very short. It's very, it's very small uh, relative to the, the potential demand so that housing price still has tremendous uh, uh, pressure to go up. And the purchasing power of local residents in Beijing, Shanghai is still very high in the property market, okay? So these markets, I don't worry, okay? The, the worry is the second kind. The second kind of property market are in the tertiary or the fourth tier, fourth tier cities, uh, which are losing population. But isn't that a contradiction? 
the government wants to have people stay in the area they're in, not flock into the cities, because that has actually been part of the problem, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, very good question. Okay, uh, let me explain to you. There are three worlds of cities in China. <laughs> China is a, is a world of its, its universe of its own, okay, in terms of urbanization, okay? The first world has is having only one city, that is city of Beijing. And the city of Beijing, uh, for whatever, whatever reason, is under control in its population expansion, okay? The city of Beijing has already well over is the, uh, the planned target of population, whatever it is, 20 million or 25 million, okay? So city of Beijing is one, is a world of its own. It's under control as you, as you pointed for population inflow. Whereas the second world of cities are Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou. Uh, these are budding cities. These are growing cities. The economic dynamism, is very powerful. Okay, they are attracting population, and they are also attracting uh, high-income people. That's why housing price in the second world of cities in China is still increasing. Whereas uh, the majority of cities, in terms of number, are in the third world of urbanization. Third world of cities. These are the tertiary and the fourth-tier cities. They are able. And they are also encouraged, and also they want to attract pop inflow of population. I explain oftentimes to our friends, okay, in China, that in China we will have a war of population, a war, W-A-R, okay? What is the war of population? That is cities, many cities are fighting for the in, inward migration. They're fighting for population in order to make the economy of their cities bigger, in order to make their local property market continuously prosperous. So the hope is with the uh, more than 500 million population currently living in the rural area, they will be moving to the second world or third world cities in China. China has been that engine of growth for Asia. If China slows down, what happens to the rest of us? Well, I do not worry too much about uh, the uh, slowing down of the Chinese economy for uh, the rest of the world. A 5% uh, GDP growth in China uh, is as much as 8% 10 years ago, okay, because the Chinese economy has become so large nowadays. So for the rest of the world, I don't, not, I don't worry too much. This time around, the major impact of the Chinese economic turbulence will be domestic. So I believe that China's economy will uh, slow down between now and um, uh, maybe two years from now. In the coming two, three years, Chinese economy will be, will be very will, relatively slow will be growing at low fives, low five percent. However, if, if proper policy adjustments are done, the economy will go back to higher growth rates, something like low 6%, 6 percent, 6.1, 6.2. Why? Why is that? Super, super simple reason, which I already explained to you. In China, we still have 1 billion population, 1 billion population who have not made it Okay, the Chinese population is 1.4, right? So I often say 1.4 is, is 1 plus 0 0.4, okay? The 0 0.4 billion, the 400 million population include people like me. We are, luck, we are, we are happy, we are, we are fortunate, we are lucky. We are living in comfortable modern life. We have air conditioning, we have winter heating, we have cars. We are traveling rapid rail, we, we take airplanes, we travel abroad. However, 
there are one billion population of Chinese who have, many of them have not ever boarded in, in an airplane. Many of them have only watched the rapid rail on TV. Many of them do not have winter heating uh, uh, and, and, and summer air conditioning, okay? However, they are smart people. Most of them are reasonably well educated. Most of them have at least eight or nine years of basic education. Many of them have at least are able, they are literate. They are able to, to, to recognize at least 2,000 Chinese characters. And they are able to speak the Putonghua, that is, the, they speak a, a language understood by, uh, by, by all Chinese here, not the local dialects. So they are willing to work hard. This, they are the hope of the Chinese economy. So this one billion population, I call one billion, one billion, one billion engines of economic growth, uh, have to be mobilized, have to be, have to be kickstarted. How to do that? Urbanization, which I mentioned before. So more people coming into the cities is what you want. Let's look also at the youth population. We can already see signs of rising unemployment amongst youth. It's up at about 15%, which is way higher than the average for the whole labor market, which is only about 4 or 5%. So is this a worrying trend? There are already anecdotal evidence that there is, you know, there are kids who have MAs who are doing jobs like packing toys in a factory. I would argue that the educated person uh, working in the assembly line, as, uh, putting together toys, uh, is actually much better than the uneducated person doing the same job. Why? Because, because the educated person would, will not do that for long. They will gather uh, experience doing that. They, before long, they will jump to other jobs. Is the current crackdown on a lot of the big tech companies in China, is that an appropriate thing to do at this time? Because in fact, the tech companies are often the ideal place where many young people want to work. Well, first we have to understand what, what the, the, the reason for the uh, campaign uh, uh, against uh, big tech companies. The reason behind that is actually uh, very similar to the current uh, 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 policies in the US. You know, in the US, um, congressmen and also a lot of uh, uh, government officials are talking about the big tech companies becoming too powerful and they are interfering with the uh, social issues and political issues like uh, election. Similarly, in China, uh, uh, politicians are worried about these big tech, big tech companies having too much influence in in areas outside their, their area of expertise. They have too much influence on people's uh, social attitudes. So, so they are same, the same. US, China face the same problem, even though people think the US, China are very different. On this issue, very, very much the same. That, that is the government and the platform companies in, in the technology are having problems with each other, okay? Now, the second point I want to mention that I believe, I believe these, campaign uh, in correcting, quote unquote, correcting the big tech companies is drawing to the end. It's drawing to the end, okay? That is the main, the main objectives uh, have already been achieved. Do you think this is going to be a very turbulent rest of the year and next year as well for China? As an observer, uh, I, I, I believe that um, the coming two years will be critical, critical, okay? Why is that? The coming, if, the, if, if many policies uh, come out at the same time in the coming two years in trying to resolve many of the, of the uh, long-term issues of the Chinese economy at the same time, there will be a very crowded period of policies and this crowded period of policies will cause damage to the, to the macro economy. The economy will slow down um, uh, unnecessarily. To a very low level, okay. So, so I call, I, I call, I, I propose that the policies in the coming two years should be moderate. You're not an epidemiologist nor a virologist, but you are an economist. You know this pandemic has been having a terrible effect on all economies. What happens when China really opens its borders? Most likely, after the winter Beijing Winter Olympics, China will open up 
and that will also increase cases of infection. However, the impact on the economy will be minimum, and there will be the ad mental adjustment, mental adjustment among Chinese uh, among Chinese citizens. Uh, that is that is not to focus on the cases of, of infection. That is to be more relaxed about cases of infection, rather focus more on fatal cases. So you're saying that the general economy should be still be able to function with people having COVID so long as they're not dying in the hospitals in large numbers. Correct. Of course, I'm an economist, so you have to, <laughs> you have to, so somehow uh, discount my, 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 my prediction, okay, my, 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 my points, okay. My prediction is that there will be opening up somewhere in the middle of next year, and then after that, there will be more cases reported of infection. However, uh, the, the, the case of, uh, of, of uh, fatal, of death, of death associated with uh, the COVID will not increase very much. So in the end, in the end, the economy will recover. People will go back to their normalcy rather than uh, rather than very tight in their in their in their mind uh, uh, about uh, the COVID cases. Professor Li, thank you very much for being on in conversation. You're most welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you.